and welcome to the Environmental Weed Control webinar. Good afternoon. Uh, we have a lot to get through. We've got a lot of questions to get through. We've got a wonderful panel that will introduce themselves in a moment, but I would like to start by acknowledging that here in Healesville, we are sitting on Wurundjeri country and to pay my respects to elders past and present and acknowledge that the Wurundjeri people have lived on this land for many thousands of years and know a lot about uh, vegetation management. So thank them for their custodianship of country. And uh, we are, I guess that's a good segue. Uh, we are very lucky to have one of our panelists, uh, Darren Wandon, who is a Wurundjeri, Wurundjeri man. And uh, I'd like to start the introductions by passing over to him. Uh, yeah, I'm Darren Wandon, Wurundjeri man, uh, working at Yarra Angels Council now in partnership with the Fire Six Alliance. Uh, past history in land management, about half my life, uh, most notably a uh, long time spent with the Burundi Narrow Rangers. Um, yeah, big interest in, in weed control as uh, I suppose our, our goal is to get uh, country back to being healthy and in balance again and um, turn our, our food and medicine species from protected species back to species that we actually can access again. So it's a big interest of mine. So thank you very much. My name's Colin Arnold and I have been managing goats for about 15 years now to control vegetation or manage vegetation. My background is as a horticulturalist. So I've got 40 years experience as a nurseryman, growing plants, particularly growing indigenous plants. And I know how, uh, how weeds are a real problem in our environment and particularly in our bush regen sites. So I've wanted to for a long time, uh, see if we could manage these sites with far less if, even no chemical if we can. And uh, so that's why I use goats and we have some success with that, yeah. Uh, my name's Paul Smithker. I'm Weed Management Officer at Yarra Rangers Council and have been at council for over 11 years. I've been in the bushland management industry for over 21 years uh, in both public and private sectors. Uh, yeah, no, I'm, yeah, my current role involves doing a lot of uh, vegetation assessments for uh, our programmed bushland sites. Uh, so looking at the actual structure and looking at the quality, uh, but also highlights the weeds that are present and um, find out uh, how we can then pass that on to our bushland contractors and our community groups to um, then manage those. Uh, yeah, I'm interested in this field, uh, particularly in, in restoring our native uh, vegetation, our native flora and fauna. Uh, so I also do a lot of um, uh, monitoring of, of fauna, which is through infrared cameras. Uh, and, and so we see all these you know, night critters at night time mostly, a lot of them are nocturnal. Um, so we use that information to then manage our sites better. Uh, also do monitoring of uh, threatened species. Uh, my name is Sharon Mason. I work for, I do on ground work in the bushland. I work for Gilby Environmental Services. And my main interest and what I do mostly is try and preserve ground story plants like lilies and orchids and little native herbs and things. Um, and the weeds I mostly deal with are grassy weeds, um, belt grass, the Ehada recta, Ehada long Flora, um, Riser maximum, the quaking grass, um, Ianthosanthum, sweet metal grass, and um, Allium. Um, I think that's what I've got to say. Awesome. Thank you. So uh, I should also add uh, that apologies from Uncle Dave Wandon, who can't be with us today, uh, and also introduce myself. Um, I'm Councillor Joanna Skelton. So I'm the councillor for the List Award of the Arrangers area. Um, so sort of down on the hill, the other side from Hillsville, down on the, um, the Danyong Mountains. And um, also to say thank you for joining us today because I forgot to say that as well. So thank you for everyone who is joining us from your home or from work or wherever you happen to be. And um, thanks for hanging in there because we did have to change the date. So I'm glad you could uh, join us anyway. Um, I guess just to contextualise uh, weeds and vegetation management and um, we'll, we'll try to start off with some general questions I hope. Um, there's been a lot of talk very recently um, post the devastating storms that came through and brought down a lot of trees about 
what could um, potentially open up um, the canopy and you know changes that might happen in the in the private land and in bushlands. So um, does anyone want to sort of talk about you know what might happen as a result of that um, just as a sort of localized example? Is anyone feeling that question? <laughs> Well, as in if there's less trees. Yep. Yeah. So I'm just thinking if there's less trees, um, some uh, friends of groups and other people who are sort of working on the ground have thought that perhaps um, it might maybe dry out some areas having less cover yeah, or shade, yeah. um, maybe open it up to different weeds um, species that might come in. Yeah. Or maybe open up to more natives. I mean, I don't, I, because I work, mostly in the city of Manningham and Maroondah. Um, in our area, I actually think there's too many trees and they're out competing what I'm interested in, the ground story. So in some of those areas, which have got quite a nice ground story, especially with a drying climate, um, it's probably good to have less trees. But it may be a different scenario. Yeah, the context of this is yeah, a lot of it will hit the dandenongs. So in the mountain ash wet forest environment. Yeah. And um, yeah, the whole landscape there has changed in certain parts. Like the, the areas where there was lots of trees, you can just see the views now all the way through. So yeah, I mean, with that, in that regard, for sure, there's there's going to be a potential for like the disturbance of the uprooted trees that will, you know, that's disturbed now the soil. It, it, it's uh, it will open it up for you know it could be regeneration. Don't don't get me wrong. Like in some areas, if it's in good condition originally, it may come back with uh, more sunlight. But uh, but there yeah, there's a great chance that weed species will start to penetrate into those disturbed sites. But other gaps will we Euclid feed into? It has to have gaps. Too, but two, but yeah, look, yeah. mountain ash tends yeah. to Wait the like fire. the fire. Yeah. yeah, so um, yeah, which yeah, so it's it's a it's a difficult task. Uh, I think to uh, it's all that's uh, uh, obviously at the moment it's about safety, so it's about clearing it to make sure that it's not a fire risk. Um, and yeah, just you know, because some sections you just can't get into. Like it's, you know, I mean, you could probably see it even out at Lilydale. The Linda Creek Trail there, you could just look along there and just see that all of them have just pretty much gone down. Wow. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a matter of uh, waiting to see um, and, and potentially putting in a bit more effort into controlling the weeds in some of those areas. But hopefully, fingers crossed, that there is a bit more regen. It's a, it is a fascinating subject. And I think the, uh, you know, we love trees. You can't argue that trees aren't wonderful in the environment and very important. Uh, they certainly are. But we have a real love affair with trees. And I think that uh, from a habitat perspective, I think we, we focus on trees and shrubs a lot, but I think there's enormous habitat uh, potential in our ground flora, in our really low ground flora. And uh, so I, I, I tend to sit a little bit on the side of the fence of maybe in some cases, we, we, we over plant trees. I know that uh, some of the grasses, for example, uh, sedges and uh, plants like lamandra, certainly the juncus, but themida, kangaroo grass, some of the poas, microlina, these can be quite long lived plants. Uh, you know, we think of trees as, you know, 70, 80, 100 years, but grasses can live for a long time and uh, they're deep rooted and they are enormously important in the, in the, in the environment. And I think. I've forgotten the percentage, but it's a horrendously high percentage, 90 plus percent of grasslands are lost. Uh, so, so once upon a time, we only had indigenous flora on the ground and they would have been uh, made up of a lot of grasses. Uh, we've lost so many of them. Uh, so I think uh, in some cases, a greater emphasis on ground flora is really important. Uh, mm -hmm. Great for not only uh, you know, the habitat of uh, skinks and lizards and butterflies, but, uh, but all the predatory birds that uh, sit in the trees looking down on those grassland areas, those more open areas. Um, I, yeah. think, I think that's really important. Uh, I, but I think to save that as well, you do need some trees. Like oh, where we've totally lost trees yeah. because of other issues, they weren't storms. It's like that. Like you lose, the, just they dry out the soil and stuff, which means that some of those native plants can actually not be overtaken by 
so much bulk in the grass or, or you then have to do sort of slashing or mowing to keep those other herbs in there if there's no trees. You sort yeah. of need those gaps in the, and obviously I'm talking from a bit of a drier country mm. than you're in. So mm. I guess it's very important to consider, I guess, what your aim is, whether mm. you're looking to provide habitat or whether you're looking to um, perhaps restore the land what would be growing there, which is obviously very different in, you know, the wet wet areas to the dryers and, and Yarra Rangers kind of has it all. Um, and yeah, oh, sorry, Darren, you were, did you oh, want to- Oh, sorry, yeah, I'll just, just saying uh, with the trees falling over, so I suppose the um, the personal experience of Yarra Valley, the weeds I've seen come back in those areas where it's been disturbed soil are things like pittos and, um, you know, the ivy leaf uh, holly and stuff like that. And I find that where the areas where we do have those native grass covers, um, even though the land does get disturbed, we've got those natives, native grass covers, sorry, um, we don't tend to see those weeds pop up in those areas. So it's sort of like a, it's almost like to me, it's proof to say that if we have those native grass, grass covers, it, there is a resilience to the land to not allow weeds to jump the landscape. So I can, uh, yeah, I'm 100% on board. A bit, of, a bit more focus towards those ground covers. Yeah, yeah. We'll come to, um, I was going to ask the next question for you. So can I ask it and then perhaps you can tie in? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, so this is kind of like a, a general thing. I'm imagining that I'm a, a, a private land holder who has a lot of weeds on my um, property. Um, and I, I guess, you know, where do you, where do you start? And, um, you know, you're looking out and you've probably got more than 10 different weeds and, um, you know, yeah, things you want to keep, things you want to go. But what, what do you do um, first? Okay, so um, my thought always, and with following on from the other thing, is to look after what's there. And so, and that would be my response to the trees, how you look after what's left, rather than thinking about pre-European or anything like that, look after what's there. So my first thought is, you see what's there. So, and then... Um, so if you've got trees you want to keep, and I would say whether they're native or not, if you like them, then you've got ivy growing out of them, then you can just cut the ivy at the base. And if you've got some ground story species, if you know what they are, that you look around them. But I also think that weeds can be valuable too, like they're providing home. Like I wouldn't cause a desert mm. to start with. Like I would do things gradually, just gradually and, it, and let things evolve, like starts. And if you, there's nothing native there, then start in an area you like to work because you see that from your veranda or you, you mm. like being next to the footpath and talking to people as they walk past or whatever your pref you like it down there because it's whatever. Like, and I would just start small. And just keep going back to those spots where you started. Do follow up, follow up, follow up, and try and stop. Like if you've got grassy weeds, try and stop them getting there before they just drop seed again. And you can actually really move forward and, and, and feel it out. Look for the birds, look at the insects, see where they're nesting, the birds, things like that. Yeah, so sort of protect the bits that are working and that you're noticing life using and um, and sort of, Go out from there with a yeah. Well, yeah you go system. out from where there's there is some good plants. If you have some good native plants, or you have an area, and if you don't, and you want to plant, but and and it's really exciting seeing stuff as you move out. The plants move out too, um, and you might want to put a few extra species in, or you know, it depends what you want for mm. your garden as well. Yeah, just, you know, it's, it's amazing how quick plants actually do it too. Like, you know, a little bit of mm -hmm. slashing of like weedy grasses around and then like, you know, you watch the kangaroo grass seed or microliter and stuff and you watch yeah, it push yeah. out. It happens quite quick. It's very fast. It's, um, it just needs that little bit of help, doesn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I totally agree. It's all about just prioritising your, your land. Um, but in a way where you still need to um, you know, think about, you know, some of the high threat weeds if you've got them, um, if you know of them as well. Uh, but yeah, just protecting the native remnants if you if you have them there. Um, Prioritising spots. So like, you know, if you've got like a pond that you wanted to take care of, you know, that could be the first focus. It has to be every, uh, 
has to be staged. I mm. agree. Like if it was a one hit wonder, the problem with that is that, you know, yeah, you might have it all clean, but then it, it's bare. You need to replace it with something else. So then the weeds don't then come back in there and, and take over again. So. Um, and Sharon, before you mentioned um, some of the benefits of, of weeds, so I guess weeds is just a name that we've called plants that we've decided are unwanted or unloved in a particular space. And it might be that, you know, what we would call a weed here in the Yarra Ranges is not, you know, two hours that way. So, um, yeah, I guess um, thinking, about, thinking about that, um, can we just flesh out a little bit more about some of the benefits that what we would call weeds do on, on land? Because you, you mentioned <coughs> that if you clear it, it's mm. not great either um, in one fell swoop. Um, yeah, does anyone, um, would anyone like to speak, speak to that? Oh, look, I'll just I'll say I'd put in some of our council site perspective. Um, yeah, we have a few um, areas where there's powerful owls. So, uh, and then some of those sites, so they obviously need uh, hollow bearing trees, but uh, you know, they like to roost uh, in, in areas uh, where they can. And in a lot of cases they're on sweet potosporum. Uh, so like, we're not gonna then go in there and just say, right, we wanna get rid of these weeds because they're weeds in this particular area, even though mm -hmm. sweet potosporum is a native plant, um, but not native to this area. Um, and uh, yeah, so we do a staged, approach or we, we will leave them there so that they've got that that habitat there for them um, another example would be I remember when I was working for Melbourne Water we had a whole patch of red cestrum that we were targeting uh, in on Learmonth Creek in Powertown and like there, were, there was platypus um, you know sort of thriving through there um, on, they were on the edges of the creek and, and red cestrum is quite a serious weed like uh, the Marinda Dam was covered in it and uh, they had made, they've got major issues with it there. I think they've now had a big program and cleared it out and it's regenerating nicely. It's, it's coming back into native plants now. But like just for that focus to just make sure that, you know, because the, the, it looked like the platypus was actually like living in that sort of section. If we cleared it all out in that one swoop, um, yeah, it could, could have displaced that platypus. It could have been under threat. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a matter of, um, you know, working that out before going in and, and removing a lot of the weeds for sure. So they do provide habitat um, in a lot of cases, especially in a modified environment. Uh, but like when it comes to like, if it's already in pretty good condition, like bushland condition, high conservation value, lots of biodiversity, lots of native plants, well, then you're only really doing a little bit of weed control. And that's, it's, it's pretty easy to- You've already got other plants yeah. where you can rely on for habitat. Yeah, it's easy to remove there. the weeds in those situations. It's just the, the areas where it's totally modified and it's a lot of weeds. And then you've got to really look into what's there or what's the purpose like sometimes the purpose and it's another whole big issue that could be it could be a fire issue for example mm. if that's an issue if that's something that needs to be uh, acted on and you know so be it you know if it's protecting assets so yeah, there's, a, there's an interesting case i think it was uh late early, early 90s there was like a conceded effort um around victoria somewhere i can't remember exactly where so it's a bit of a you know take take it for granted with this story um but it was something about they sort of did a, the farmers did a conceded effort to get rid of a lot of blackberry in one sort of fell swoop over about a two-year period and they actually noticed a, a huge reduction in populations of superb fairy wren so it was sort of like taking it all out in one go um really affected that population sort of thing so it's sort of I know since learning that, I know that every every time I try and take out weeds and stuff like that, I'm always sort of considering about, yeah, the, the habitat of, of what animals are using it, uh, for how often, for how long, what can they use, what's the replacement there. Um, and, and, and that's in every scenario, whether you're working from forest to grasslands to, you know, to waterways, that's, I think it's applicable everywhere. And I think, I suppose, most land management would agree now that's sort of you know, at the forefront of our mind is that, um, you know, trying to understand what, what animals are using it first um, before we start going in and tearing things apart, really. Yeah. In terms of replacing blackberry, I mean, I actually think blackberry in some areas should be left. Mm. I mean, um, because I don't think there is a good replacement. If you've got an animal or a bird who's using it, I mean, especially, if, you know, in some areas they've got bandicoots amongst the blackberry on farmland and, they just shouldn't be. I don't think there is a good replacement. It is best. It starts to help like, you know, you, 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 you know, too, you know, in terms yeah. of foxes. Yeah. Foxes. Um, 
you need a, a wee to mm. to keep off the weedy predator sort of thing. Yeah, which look, you know brings in that kind of holistic nature of looking at the situation and why you're clearing it and yeah. Um, yeah, who's using it already, what you want to create, all of that stuff. But I guess, I guess um, the um, thinking about what what makes something a weed, is it just that um, it, you know, the birds will eat it, eat the blackberry or whatever it is and take it elsewhere? Like what, what you know, what kind of defines um, how much of a threat um, or how much of an impact the weed has? And, and, you know, how do you sort of take that into account um, as a land manager? Well, by definition, what weeds are, are plants that are out of place technically so i mean it could be either it's geographic it's range it's uh, by by a plant that's deemed undesirable that's, well, that's undesir the actual yeah. definite, which that, that's a scary thought to me <laughs> but, i mean, I mean I'm, yes. I'm, crazily enough sometimes it can be a native plant that's local within mm. that area because yeah. the area is just modified um kunzia was mentioned before um that particular plant bergen which is quite common across the yeah, ranges uh, sometimes, you know, or even like I've seen like sections like under power lines where they cut, like they have to cut it to a level to protect the power lines. It's just mm. the sun's just coming and it's just covered in kunzia. It's like a kunzia hedge, you know. So in those situations, that's not how it's naturally meant to grow as well. In that modified environment, it's mm. showing that that particular native species is is acting like a weed, so to, so to speak. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I suppose by definition, it's um, in a bushland sense. It's 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 where it's causing potential adverse impact on native flora and fauna or on the function of the ecosystem. And that's that's a definition by the Arthur Ryla Institute, which is a science research uh, facility um, through the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning, DELP. Um, so that's a general sort of uh, bushland context. Which is eerie because it fits right in with like, I suppose the indigenous way of doing stuff. Is it like if, if we see something that's taking over completely and not allowing other plants and other things, yeah, you know, the diversity, the, the balance. If it's it's if it's out of whack and something sort of creating that monoculture on top of things, well, yeah, that's that's not going to be mm. helpful for anyone. That means all the food, the medicine, everything's exactly. gone. You know, out of the, and out the, of the, and the diversity is there's no diversity. It's mm. just it's a thicket. Yeah, there's nothing on the ground. Um, so yeah, there's plants that are in the soil waiting to come up. That's right. They, yeah. They're running out of time. They only there's only certain time periods that those seeds can then mm. sprout. So I mean, look, but yeah, mostly weeds are from other countries. Really, most okay. a lot of our high throat weeds are uh, yeah. international. I mean, Sharon's a Kunzia, <laughs> yeah, Kunzia expert. Uh, no, <laughs> no, 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 expert. I mean, I, I, I definitely think in some situations to pull it out. I mean, I, I would pull it out when it's coming up where I've got good ground story and stuff. But I also think there's a role for those thick areas of it. I mean, we wouldn't in Manningham have yellow robins if there wasn't Kunzia thickets. So the, there is roles, uh, definitely where there's good ground story and maybe even remnants of good ground. I mean, it, it's sort of like you can't do everything. So you sort of have to prioritize, you do have to prioritize. It's a terrible word because <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's really hard. Mm. And then, then maybe where you've got a big bit of comes here and it's not that weedy underneath and maybe if you thinned it out, or took a lot of it out, you would get that that skeleton to spread and stuff, and that would be exciting. But maybe it's also good as it is because yeah. you can't you can't cover all ground. And on the other hand, too, like a thick thicket of kunzia then stops grassy weeds and other weeds from getting inside because yep. it's like a barrier. So it's yeah, it's a fine balance. Got a, like got a property with Rundry, we got, uh, it's about 60 acres and uh, I'd say about 30, 30 acres of it is covered in what we call this, this Kunzia sort of thicket. And um, we tried many, many different ideas. Um, and I think that the most effective we've had so far is going into the Kunzia thicket, finding where the good trees are, like your hazel pomodaris or some of your stringy barks or you know even some of your silver bottles and stuff like that. And just sort of going out around from those those areas and again it goes back to what we we're saying before i suppose that you know finding where your good areas are protecting what you've got and working out from that yeah. and we're starting to see a resurgence you know a lot of the silver bottles are actually getting branches in the lower levels now rather than just at the canopy um they're starting to spread out sort of thing we're starting to see um you know kangaroos take up that spot where the grasses have come back now 
uh, we're starting to see uh, different birds coming back through. A lot of the, the black hockeys are actually coming into the silver waddles and eat the grubs again rather than being blocked out by the Kunzia. So it's sort of like this, um, you know, over, over the last six years of, of doing that sort of work, we've seen a, a pretty big increase in, in the habitat of the animals using it again. So, but we haven't taken out the whole lot, like you said, you know, it's just taking out those small bits and allowing things to grow inside it. So, yeah, I think it's an think interesting one. <laughs> being an observer is really critical, isn't it? You know, you really, mm. you really want to stop, take a big breath, and, and observe yep. because there's so many tiny things that you miss. And, uh, and so if you take your time, it might, and it might be a year, if you move onto a new property, it might be a year before you even do anything, just so you actually find out what's there, what's not there, where, where are the wetter areas, where are the dry areas, and all of those sorts of things that, uh, that you can easily miss. And uh, you might move it to a property in summer and find a bunch of buttercup and then you'd go and attack that. But then winter comes and it's a big, <laughs> big floodplain and you go, yeah. oh, well, that was pointless, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah I mean, we're, we're all experts here. Yeah. Uh, but I think that the, 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 problem is, <laughs> the problem is that uh, uh, the more we know, the more we realise what we don't know. Mm. And uh, so, so there's no easy fix. There's no silver bullet. There's no one off. They're all, all the situations are different. And uh, I mean, Kunzia is a problem, but Kunzia is also a, a fantastic plant in the environment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, you know, in riparian situations where it's a bit wetter, it's not that ridge country, that dry stony ridge country, doesn't tend to be the thicket as much. And, uh, and it's a very important plant, so. Now, no one asked us about what to do with Kunzia. So I'm gonna throw out a couple of <laughs> other plants that people, um, were uh, wondering about best practice to, to deal with. Um, so, you know, we're all we're probably all across them. Um, there's mention of ivy, uh, onion weed, um, holly, uh, which you mentioned before. What was the other? There was a couple of other um, ones that were mentioned, um, but maybe even just starting there because they're three quite different plants so we've got the onion weed which is you know wetter sort of and it's got the bulb we've got the um the holly which I, i'm assuming that's the sort of the bushy kind of holly is that right and then we've got the ivy which yep. is obviously has Everywhere. its own you know growing up other things choking habit that kind of um so maybe if we talk through some of the ways that we might look at those three that might bring up some of the methods that that differ um so Maybe we'll, I'm thinking like, I'm thinking ivy, the manzy dotes and dozy dotes and little lambs in <laughs> ivy. Um. We, well, we put ivy on, uh, on a couple of metro train sites in Belgrave and up a Fentry Gully. And, and ivy is a difficult plant. It's got that shiny leaf. Um, so, um, and, it's, and it's not hard to deal with when it's run up the tree because all you need to do is cut the stems and the top will die. And then you've only got, the, the base to worry about and what's on the ground. As far as goats are concerned, goats love ivy. They just think it's chocolate. And, mm. uh, and that's really good because ivy is very persistent, very tough plant. And when it's on the ground, on mass, uh, it, it, it's a wonderful way to deal with it because they'll literally just pick off every leaf. And every time a new leaf comes on, they'll pick it off again. And, and we had some pretty horrendous uh, ivy at Belgrave Station, and that is effectively dead mm. after 12 months. And now we had a lot of others. We had uh, there's a ginger uh, garden escape on that site, blackberries, a few other things, and they've done the same thing in there as well. So, uh, so I think that ivy is not a hard one to to deal with with goats. I'm not sure how else you manage it uh, with herbicide. I'm not sure how effective that would be. Yeah, you can, oh. yeah, look, I, you can get it with herbicide, but it involves I'm not, um, fairly high rates of things. Yeah, it's, um, look, the, the, the key is to get it off the tree. Yeah, stop the, it the from the flowering and, and seeding. My feeling is always what, what, what native is it harming? Um, and that's my first priority. I mean, I haven't dealt with it much. I mean, does ivy exist in monos? 
in known areas. Oh, yes. No, it, it tends. It, 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 mm -hmm. Mowing actually works well on um, ivy. Um, yeah, because I, I think many things are like, yeah. you know, targeted well with mowing. Um, but then it brings it into like a lawn grass. So it'd be, it'd be okay for like, you know, on, on land, if you really do want it to be a mown site, then it, yeah, it will work mm. extremely well. But uh, in a bushland setting or um, in a garden where it's not mown and it's just, it's taking over, um, yeah, it can grow vigorously. You'd have to like either manually do it, which is hard work, you know, yes. like, because it, you, know, you can, you can ham weed it. Um, I've, I've had good success with ham weeding, but it's just long. It takes forever. And a lot of our contractors do it that way because of the native plants that we have, what they work with. They have to, because spraying, like you said, if you do spray with chemical, you kill everything. it's um, using quite high rates of um, chemical. Well, and that's um, spray. No, not the tree. No, no, it's just no, the ground. Yeah, so, yeah. the so it's doable, and it has to be really selective. Like you'd have to pick your spots. So, um, but I also I'd, timing for that one too. Yeah, I have, I have used chemical on it in the past. we uh, doing weed management stuff, and um, metylfurin was the was the go to at the at the time, or some brush off as people would know it. Um, and obviously penetrates and stuff being a waxy leaf to try and break down mm. that uh, that cell structure. But um, yeah, hitting it, it was around sort of Octoberish was sort of the time we, we would take it out. It was, it's, it's really active growth period. Any time outside of that, it, like I said, the, the rates go higher and higher and higher and it just starts to get ridiculous. It's like you really start to ask yourself the question of, you know, uh, I'm using this chemical and yes, sometimes they can be viable, but, you know, to the detriment of other plants, not a good idea, yeah. So when you say active growth, you mean it's got those nice green, lush new yeah. leaves, that's and right. that's what to look for before yeah. you, if you spray it. But also, as everyone said, only use the herbicide when there's nothing. When it's that when necessary. Be yeah. Herbicide. Yeah, we definitely wouldn't go introduce it to site where you've got you know orchids, lilies, that sort no. of stuff in there. There's not a chance you'd use that around there. It's just yeah. Not and and, and if it's really yeah. diverse, then I think you are. Yeah. we being um the i think most a lot of weeds that in terms of the i would use a brush cutter possibly in some situations but i don't know about ivy but a lot of weeds if you don't see them in mow but they're in the non-mow next door mm. then the chances are that some sort of because a brush cutter can move around thing other plants Mm. Um, like um, Watsonia. Um, and Maybe even... a good old fashioned, like get a bunch of friends over for a barbecue and that too, yeah. <laughs> cool. yeah. Have and a big yeah. hand this removal. Gym, hand gym. removal yeah. and bagging them up has been the, probably the most successful that yeah. we've seen it like, mm -hmm. disappear. And, it and it just means time. That's it. And mm. I think that's another thing people have to recognize when it comes to weeds is that a lot of these, a lot of places are sort of trying to go, oh, well, I've got. Yeah, and I'm talking this specifically from contractor perspective, you know, you sort of get these little one-off jobs and stuff like that. So I have all these weeds, can you come and deal with it? And you can sort of deal with it that once, but you really need that follow-up stuff. Mm. You know, if we don't do that follow-up, um, they're just going to go back to the way they were. You know? mm. yeah. Nature loves doing that. <laughs> Good. We love nature. That's why, that's why we love it. But, um, it um, okay, so we've given we've given Ivy a go. And what, what I'm just back to the goats. Um, like how do we get just some some goats into our can anyone how do you you know at a domestic you know suburban not suburban but you know small property level um how do we use goats oh, look, if we wanted to for that look i do do backyards with goats so so i i've done backyards from maribyrnong right through to mount martha and all the way in between where we just focus on backyards and some of those backyards have morning glory that have just covered everything uh, it can be ivy, it can be uh, honeysuckle. Morning glory periwinkle? No, it's no. got a purple flower. Morning purple glory is a climber. And, uh, uh, and, and so it's got quite a large uh, sort of purpley blue flower. Like a heart shaped leaf. Oh, yes, yep. I think yep. and, uh, and we did a backyard in Baldwin that was just covered in this. And, uh, and so backyards are, are, are fine because usually they're quite contained and it works quite well. Um, uh, you have to be careful of fruit trees, but uh, uh, goats aren't that selective. And that's the big problem with goats. They're not selective. But, but we don't tend to put goats into sites where we have orchids or we have nice things. We tend to put goats onto sites that are covered in either one or a number of invasive weeds. So, so certainly ivy, but wandering trad, um, certainly blackberries, 
um, honeysuckle. We were talking before uh, off air, we were talking about uh, jasmine is, is, is a particularly invasive plant now. And so, so what you often get is you'll get a number of these weeds in situations. And they may have once been good habitat or indigenous areas, but they've become completely dominated. And, uh, and so, so goats can be extremely effective to just knock down that intense biomass. Even kaikuyu, which is a really big spongy grass that if it's left, if, it's fine if you can mow it, but a lot of these sites we can't mow. A lot of them are too steep or they're rocky or they've got shopping trolleys hidden <laughs> underneath them or there's some issue that you can't get in there. That. <laughs> and so you can put a very nimble goat in there and it will just dance around looking for every yummy thing it can find. The trick, and it doesn't matter whether it's goats or herbicide or mowing or people, it's about management. It's about knowing when to do it, what, you know, what you're trying to achieve, you know, are there things in here we need to protect? Uh, we, do, we do backyards, but we largely do commercial sites. And some of these commercial sites are, we do a lot of work on Eastlink, for example. Now that was a, a constructed landscape that was planted up with indigenous plants. There are some pockets where we've got remnant soil. And when you've got remnant soil, you've got fungi in the soil. You've got, you've got all sorts of things at ground level that should be there because they were always there. Um, but we've got these weeds that are coming in, gradually taking over. And, uh, and so goats are fantastic in that environment because they'll open it up, they'll reduce the biomass. So it doesn't matter whether it's a backyard or a commercial job, we need, to, we need to get it down a little bit so we can mm. actually see some ground, so we can see what possibly was there or what, has, what now has a chance to come up. And, uh, um, you know, it doesn't really matter what, you know, potosporums, you know, we touched on potosporum, but uh, uh, yeah, there might be a situation where you want to uh, leave potosporum because of certain things. Potosporum is male and female. Mm. So you get a male tree and a female tree. So you may want to go through and again, just take a big breath, look at your tree, see what's there, see where are the females. The take berries. those out. Yep. <laughs> take the ones with the berries out. They can change. Yeah, they oh. can change well, sex, I'm afraid. Well, <laughs> well, but, um, well, it, doesn't, yeah. it still doesn't change the fact that you go through and you say, okay, so here are the facts. That's the thing. And then, yeah. and then yeah. if, if right. they change, if they do the big yeah. change, <laughs> then you take yeah. those yeah. ones yeah. out. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. With all the weeds as well. Forest, yeah. You go after the... the the female ones, yeah. the fruiting like, so ones. The if you get the fruiting the ones, the yeah, that's a good, that's yeah, a really good start, that's or a right. good focus. So what's, what's the advantage of goats over using a brush cutter? They're well, cute. Labor. Have you seen their yeah, eyes? more fun, yeah, more fun to watch. <laughs> sure, yeah. Surely it's human that, labor, isn't it? Just, oh, do you want to sit here if we don't have to do it? I it's think good on between you. I think there's a number of advantages. <laughs> First of all, I think one of the advantages is that. In some situations, and again, I stress that, not in all situations, but in some situations, uh, a goat can replicate a native herbivore that we no longer have on site. So we don't have kangaroos, wallabies, wombats on, on a lot of these sites. So, so if you manage them well, for example, I've got 80 kilo goats that will do an enormous amount of damage, right? And so we judge our view of goats in the environment on those or on feral goats. But I also have little four-month-old goats that are very small. Cute, very cute. They are cute, <laughs> but they tend to look Winner. for they tend to look for the problem plants and the and the grassy weeds. Mm. They tend to look for the exotic grasses. That's I love Breeza, for example. Just, yeah. Breeza is sweet, and they'll they'll go for that every time. So. Is so, the orange, Monbreeze, is that? What no, no, it's, no. it's, it's a grass weed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Quaking grass. grass. Fly-blown grass. Yeah. Quaking yeah. grass. Yeah. Yeah. So now they love Dianellas and they love Themida. And, but, but Themida has always been grazed. Microlina has always been grazed. And these grasses can actually benefit from being grazed. So I think there's an advantage if you manage it well. But, but the biggest advantage is that, that they are there 24-7. And if you put them on for a specific period of time and then take them off, they'll reduce that biomass more effectively, more efficiently, and arguably more environmentally than any other way. Yeah, yeah arguably, <laughs> but but you're not using you're not using you're not using equipment. Uh, sure, if you can hand weed, but 
but that's the most expensive. Yeah, yeah, so yeah but no I think with a brush coat, yeah. you can be very selective. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm just exploring it. Oh, that's that's good. And, and you know, you don't have to put up the fencing. You don't have yeah. to worry about dogs getting into your goats, and you know, and and you can be, you know, fairly selective. Mm. And, and, it, and it takes quite a, I presume it takes quite a lot of time bringing the goats in, taking the goats out, all that sort of stuff takes time. Yeah, they're definitely one option in that um, yeah. things you can do because, yeah, as we were talking earlier, you know, I think a lot of people I know are like, yeah, let's get a goat. And it's like, you've never had a goat before. They're pretty particular um, <laughs> about what they need and to be safe and for the, you know, not to escape and all those other things. Colin, but... Sorry, I talked over you. Right. Colin, do you hire them out or you, how do you work it? Yeah, my business is we hire them out and uh, because I do encourage people not to get their own <laughs> <laughs> uh, because they will eat you out of house and home and they can be difficult animals to work with. As cute as they are, they <laughs> can be a real pest. And someone sent me a video of a goat running down Thompson's Road recently <laughs> and causing traffic chaos. Um, but I know that all the organisations I work for, their biggest problem is goats getting out. So we make mm -hmm. sure as much as we can that they don't do that. Um, but, uh, but it's better to hire them because you can literally... So a number of people that I work for have... Uh, they've got uh, private property uh, and they've got a creek flowing through. So they get a grant from Melbourne Water to fence it off or to assist with them doing that so that we can put goats on and off, on and off, on and off to target the blackberries, target the invasive weeds. They'll graze often, they'll often graze through carracks and powers and things like that that are there so that those things can actually see the light of day better. Uh, so we reduce the biomass so that, uh, the, and, it, and it's a slower process, it's a managed process and you don't have the cost of, and the nightmare of having a goat your, uh, yourself, you can hire it so we can bring it in. And, and most of my clients who do that love it because it's easy. They just give me a call and say, can we have the goats back and we take the goats back. Um, yeah. What you mentioned before about um, the right time or Darren and Colin, you both mentioned it, um, made me think of what you always say um, <laughs> about um, right country, right yeah. Time, right, right fire. fire. That's it, Probably yeah. got it. Is there a particular order? Yeah, that was good. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, do you want to talk through a little bit more about how, yeah, your, the timing as far as and the other um, things as far as clearing areas with fire or not just clearing, but well, it's interesting. Just, just what Colin was saying there, actually, yeah, something just triggered there about the, you know, saying how the goats were chewing down the um, uh, like poles and carracks and stuff like that. Uh, a lot of what we do in terms of uh, using fire sticks is actually around trying to give those those native plants, um, you know, sort of getting rid of that that dry, uh, you know, and like that dry sort of mm. masses that build up underneath them. He's trying to uh, relieve them of that so they can get that nice fresh growth mm. to come back through. So it's actually quite a similar process. Um, but yeah, the, uh, going on, I suppose, right time, right country, right fire. Um, it's it's so land specific, you know, it's uh, it's almost doing land a bit of a disservice to, to talk about it when you're not on, on country mm. sort of thing. Um, I know there, there, I think there was a question there, someone had mentioned about, uh, you know, putting fire up in, in Mountain Ash country. Mm. Um, and that sort of creates a bit of a, I suppose, a Pandora's box, because if I say that, yes, there is parts of Mount Nash country that we do burn, um, that doesn't mean we burn all of Mount Nash country. Um, within Mount Nash country, there is many different soil types that are going underneath that. And there's very, very, very many different vegetation types underneath there as well, plus very different climates. Um, so yeah, it's there's where there has been burning in some parts of Mount Nash country, there's other parts that haven't been burnt. And that's up to actually reading the country and understanding what's there before we put the fire in there. Um, so yeah, it's uh, to say it's it's easy would be just such a disservice. It's it's not a it's not a simple solution. It's it's a very very complex way of looking at land. Um, but I find that talking with fellow land managers, um, you guys seem to jump on board quite easily with this sort of stuff. It's stuff that you you're already doing things like reading country and and being a part of it and understanding. I think you mentioned before, Colin, about you know just observing. You know that that's that is what mm. reading country really is. What it comes down to is actually observing and seeing those triggers in the landscape. 
um, understanding that what happened to the different seasons and not your typical four that we go off in the calendar, the actual Australian seasons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that we have the, the eight in one day type thing. Um, and understanding things like you know climate change that, that's happening at the moment and seeing you know for instance like we have uh, the tree ballot uh, which is a you know beautiful food source um, you yeah, know if we can beat the birds to it but that generally only has berries in the spot that I'm used to it uh, around here in Hillsville you know from anywhere from October through to February uh, for the last three years that's had berries on it all year round mm -hmm. um, that's a sign to me to say that something's different in the, in the weather patterns that something is saying that it's warm enough for that to um, to have more berries on it so little, yeah, little signs like that that we have to respond to um, in order to understand when we put fire on country and when we don't. Um, and I really have to stress that is that the, the idea of not putting fire on country is one of the most important things that we can say is because if we do just go ahead and burn because we feel that it's the right time, you know, just because we said so, we're not actually listening to the country, mm. um, there is so much, so much chance to put more to actually affect the country worse than what it was in the first place um so yeah, it's a really careful sort of thought out process yeah now, how, how do you i know with cultural burning you, you you prefer that sort of really low cool burn absolutely yeah but you don't always have that luxury do you no not at all so how do you um, get on with that you know, especially when we're talking about weeds it's it's always uh you know the, when it comes to that sort of stuff you know if it, if it's a low amount of weeds then sure, we'll just mix the fire in amongst it to, to have that cool burn. Um, but sometimes you get a high amount of uh, fuel loads like um, uh, Phalaris, for instance, which is an absolute horrible plant um, or grass, should I say. You know, that, that's the kind of stuff that I, I'm i almost convinced we can blame majority of bushfires on just about from this, the ignition point, having been around you know, large ones that have been burnt before through, um, through fires. The amount of radiant heat those things throw off is just incredible. Um, so, yeah, I... Generally, there is a lot of uh, physical work that has to be done beforehand. Um, mm. You know, we have to, to go in and physically remove these plants um, in order to put fire in there, uh, particularly things like, you know, if we're burning around Kunzia and stuff like that, we have to sort of make it safe for that. Um, yeah, the Phalaris, uh, things like, I suppose, if you've got a, a massive pitto through there, um, that's generally not so bad, but generally if you're trying to put a fire through a pitto forest, there's nothing underneath that's actually yeah. growing. So it's sort of right. kind of hard to put fire in there, you know? Um, so yeah, it's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of pre-work that gets done in, I suppose, in weed affected areas before uh, culture fire can be put in there. So um, yeah, we're really looking at, we're trying to look at places where we have actual, you know, a fairly good amount of native vegetation there to begin with in order to, I suppose, help expand it out in those areas as well, yeah. Mm, um, thank you. And I, I was just wondering about um, that relationship between um, land care groups and friends of groups um, and probably private landholders and, and how they might, um, you know, I guess whether cultural burning is something that they should reach out about or how, how does that go? Like if, if someone's watching that has a property that's larger than a back, you know, small backyard, yep. um, can they reach out yet or yes, where are we at in that? They actually can reach out. You can, if you're on Wurundjeri country, you can contact the Wurundjeri now at Rangers. Mm -hmm. Um, Uncle Sean Hunter there will take care of all your, all your needs and have a discussion with you about that. Um, if you're not on Wurundjeri country, please talk to your local traditional owners. If you can't, if you're struggling to find who's there, please contact the Fire Sticks Alliance um, and they will be able to help direct you to the right person to help out with that. Awesome. Um, and can you speak to just a little bit, because it's still quite new that Yarra Rangers Council has you in this new role, how many, yes. how many months in? Six, uh, not even six months, surely. I think I've just hit three months, I think. Three yeah. months. So um, <laughs> can you just say still. a very small amount about yeah. um, something about what you're doing at Yarra Rangers Council in this area? Yeah, cool. Uh, so I'm part of the Indigenous Development Team, but my role is the Fire Sticks Coordinator. Um, and it is my job at this stage to help well, to help coordinate getting fire sticks back onto Yarra Rangers country, but also help, I suppose, show other councils how to lead in this space in order of, uh, I suppose, having traditional owner methods being led by traditional owners. Um, so a lot of a lot of communication between myself and the Narrow Rangers and also the Fire Sticks Alliance and, you know, essentially picking pilot sites along Yarra Rangers Council uh, that offer you know, different landscapes um, to try and introduce fire back in there and also get it in the public eye to try and uh, win the hearts and minds of the people. <laughs> so try and get, I suppose, reduce that fear factor when it comes to fire. Um, we don't want to see fire as a scary thing. Fire can be a useful tool, 
Um, as we've heard before, it's not a silver bullet solution, um, but it is just another another tool in the toolbox, and we should really look at it, I suppose, in in that light, um, in a way to sort of bring back balance. So yeah, my my role could absolutely consist of uh, yeah, reintroducing it back on the Our Rangers Council uh, land. Yeah. Very exciting. Um, Paul, we might come over to you because there were a lot of questions around um, what council is doing. So, the, you know, people who are like, well, on my private land, I do this. Why is there still protosperum or, or certain things on council owned land? Um, and yeah, what, what are we doing? What are we using? How, how are you sort of prioritising um, what method gets used? And um, I was hoping you'd speak to that a little bit. Oh, sure. Uh, well, uh, Yarra Rangers Council area is quite a, a big council. Like when you look at the, um, uh, it, it's within the greater Melbourne region. And if you look at all the council boundaries, like we just blow them out of the water, we're just that large. Um, but like having said that, um, a majority of us um, are crown land. So that's uh, owned by state government. And uh, so that's all well, that you're looking at about, oh, what is it? I think it's 68%. Oh. Is, so a lot of that's like um, dams, um, national parks, <coughs> state forests. Uh, and then private land is 30%. Uh, so that's quite high too. And then council land is, you know, it might sound small and it's only 2%, but it actually is quite a bit. Like if you put that into context, like we still have 916 hectares of, of reserves. So that includes like bushland reserves, open space, parklands, Etc. like where council buildings are as well, like community halls and that sort of thing. Uh, but that also includes roadsides. And so if you think of the roadsides, we've got like 1,768 kilometres, something like that, almost 1,800 kilometres of roadsides that we are meant to manage. You know, like a lot of them are urban nature strips and a lot of residents do take care of those and mow it and, and just manicure it themselves. But um, there is a lot of like the peri-urban areas, which mean... They're sort of in between, so they're, they're kind of not nature strips, they're roadside reserves, and then there's also out in the rural landscape where there are a lot of roadside reserves as well. So, I mean, those areas you know, take up, they, they have a lot of weeds, uh, um, unfortunately. And um, so we, we really tend to, back to that word, prioritise, I'm afraid, um, mm. with the funding <laughs> that we have to be able to protect our biodiversity. So we go for our high conservation sites first, or even our sites that have got high public use. So for example, Lulidar Wake is probably one that would be like really heavily used. So that has a lot of management on that site. Uh, but like in our bushland team, we'd be considering like some of our really high conservation sites as our priority, but also some of the public use sites as well. Um, but yeah, so our focus is to spend money to protect those areas so that would in involve like a lot of native veg a lot of native flora use these sites so um yeah that's our priority um but we do have like it, it scales between that and to absolutely weedy mess i suppose as well you know so when it comes to those sites um look we don't do a lot in there because we don't have the funding for it we try and manage what we can uh it's yeah, it's a matter of just you know doing that priority list so First, it's our high con, then our medium con, and then it goes to our low. And when it comes to our low con sites, we may then just look at, uh, like looking at really high threat weeds, you know, like just to stop them from, from spreading. So when it comes to weed management um, in, that, in our high conservation sites, we will, uh, we will do a lot of hand weeding. Like a lot of our uh, skilled bushland contractors, uh, like uh, Sharon, uh, would go in there and they'll be hand weeding those sites. They'd be brush cutting or they'd be, They'd be cutting and painting as well. So they would be using herbicide because in some situations, you know, we've, we've got woody weeds, you know, like it needs to, you need to stop it from growing. A lot of them re-sprout. Some of them do just... What's cutting and painting? So it's cutting and painting is a, a technique where um, you do have like a little spray bottle or a little dabber bottle. It's like a shoe polish bottle. Uh, it will contain herbicide in there, mostly um, glyphosate. Uh, and it's used to, to stop that weed from growing. So like in some cases, like for example, pine trees don't need it. Sallow wattle doesn't need it. You can just cut them and they won't come back. Uh, but uh, a lot of weeds do. Sycamore maple, English holly, um, you know, you, it, it, and it will come back vigorously. Like we've seen it before, we've cut it without putting any treatment on it. And, you know, it comes up like a, like it sprouts like a hedge and it makes it worse. It's hard to then manage. Um, so that's that method. 
But when it comes to like areas like mm -hmm. where it's in between, where there's a mishmash of weeds and native plants to protect, then we have to have a, a mix of, of tools, like Darren was saying, the toolkit. So it will involve sometimes spot spraying as well with knapsacks. Um, it will, you know, involve hand weeding, brush cutting, slashing, um, you know, and then and we're, if we're lucky, we can use fire as a tool. Um, we haven't used goats as much, and purely that's because um, we prioritise our high conservation areas first. Uh, and yeah, we need we we you know goats will might go after the grassy weeds, but then you know if, if it's if there's a lot of native plants, they're going to go after that as well, unfortunately. So um, yeah, if we had, if we had funding for some of those low con sites, goats probably would be a good response for some of those weedy environments. Um, and yeah, so that's that's pretty much an overview of, of what we do. So in-house, we have staff that do the work and we've got specialist bushland contractors that do the work for us as well. Right, and um, before uh, some of you have mentioned sort of this, the techniques that you might use before using um, herbicides. Um, and I guess it'd be good to sort of, for those, a, who have no issues using herbicides and B, who really don't want to use herbicides at their own properties, maybe to just, if we have a bit of a conversation around why you would and would not use it, um, what situations might be um, needed um, to use that and, and how you sort of decide decide that, because I think it's a, it's a bit scary if you move out here and you're used to just a little backyard and you've maybe moved out here and then sort of people are going, oh yeah, you spray that or you do this. Um, how to, yeah, how should people sort of approach spraying um maybe colin i know that you're not using it so <laughs> maybe you'd be a good person to speak to sort of why why you don't and why you wouldn't yeah look i and again i understand why people use herbicide herbicide is a is an important uh, weapon in our arsenal against weeds <clears throat> there's no question about that um uh, uh but i think that the problem is that it it can often be a bit of a default position that we'll just go to automatically and uh, uh and 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 you can get very good effects uh, a re really good result with herbicide but not always um but i think for me the biggest problem with herbicides are that uh, cut and painting is not so bad because you're using a very small amount in a very concentrated situation so that's fine i i don't have a big deal with that but uh, but we we don't know yet really the full impact. Uh, we can see that the plant dies. Uh, you know, healthy bush doesn't tend to get invaded by weeds anywhere near as much as as uh, um, uh, uh, ground that's been um, disturbed. And that's there's a whole lot of reasons for that. Uh, we may not even know all the reasons, but but it could be very much that uh, the soil is healthy. The soil is full of bacteria and fungi and a whole microflora that, that is complex and detailed. And uh, so, so when we go in and we dig it up or we apply a herbicide or we do something else that disturbs all of that, uh, we're in the same way that we're losing plants, uh, we're probably losing fungi as well. And all those things are interwoven. And uh, so the, the further away we can get from that, the better. Um, now weeds, some, some weeds are what we call allelopathic. That means that they'll actually produce uh, a chemical compound that will reduce the growth of other plants around them. So they can dominate. So blackberries are a bully. They'll just get in and they'll just muscle everybody else out and they'll <laughs> win. But ranunculus only grows sort of 30 centimetres high or lower. And uh, so it's quite low. So how does that dominate? It dominates because it's allelopathic, because it produces effectively a herbicide. And there's a number of plants that'll do that. Um, so, so the soil is impacted enormously because we disturb it, because we use herbicide, because weeds change the soil profile. So the more we can do to, uh, to leave the soil alone, the better. Hot burns aren't great, but cool burns are terrific because they create smoke, which, which affects the germination of seeds that we otherwise wouldn't see germinate. Uh, now we can get weeds germinate because of fire and we can get native plants germinating from fire. So I guess it's complicated, isn't it? It's, it's really involved. 
And um, so we need every area of skill. We need every area of expertise to tackle an enormous range of weeds. We've named three or four, mm. five today, but there's an enormous range of I've weeds. Got, I've got my, my little books that I look at at home. <laughs> there you go. There's like... There you go. Pages and pages, and I'm like, "Yep, we've got that. Yeah, yeah. we've got this." It's <laughs> That's right. um, there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot. So, so, um, so if you can minimise disturbance, uh, you know, I've seen weed control done with big equipment where they'll, they'll they'll scalp the top layer of soil to get a clean area. Well, I would think that that's not what you would want to do. Um, um, you wouldn't want to put goats in and just sh shut the gate and walk away either because they'll, they'll just take it back to nothing. Mm. So it's about careful management, um, all the things we've talked about. But, but I think you can minimise your herbicide use. I think you certainly can do that. And that's what we should be aiming to do because we don't know the full impact. We know that if we chop a tree down, we've chopped it down. If we cut it with a slasher, We've slashed it. Um, but when we apply a herbicide, we're not fully aware of what that's doing to the skink that crawls across it after we've sprayed or the bird that eats the insect that, that has landed in it and might have died. All of those things, we just don't know. So yeah, there's a bit of a bit of a thing going around at the moment about, about you know, sort of taking taking care of blackberries, you know, using things like Grazon and, and Garlon. And um, you know, spraying them during uh, flowering times, but that's obviously where we get a lot of bees you yeah. know, coming to get the uh, the pollen from there and stuff and the nectar. So it's sort of a, you know, are we already we're starting to question: Are we doing this right? You know, um, and I think that's one thing that I can say for most land managers is like, you know, we we will do the best of our abilities to our knowledge, but always look at ways to to do better, you know, and to and to reduce that impact. Um, and I think that's a big red flag for me if I have ever worked with anyone and it's the uh the, the straight away the go-to is just spray it um generally I might have a bit of a quiet word to that person <laughs> and uh talk about different methods that can be used first before we get to the uh using chemicals oh, even in fire especially ecological burns that we've done uh, quite often we'll use fire to to reduce that biomass of the weed and then wait for the the smaller things to grow to grow back yeah. and then apply a small amount of herbicide there as yeah. well um, you know, and that's only on, on plants that, you know, if we pull them out, they're generally it's not going to do much, much good. Um, so, you know, use the herbicide instead. So it's, you've really got to, I suppose, filter it down that, that sort of pest management list, I suppose, um, as to what the best method is. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. In that's terms right. of some of that, that's why follow up's really good. Like if you do go in and spray the blackberries and then you follow up the next year, I mean, you just, you're using less and less herbicide and it's sort of a one-off project in some ways that's over a number of years. And then you make sure that if you get young ones in, that you deal with them at the time. Like, so you're not necessarily using the herbicide then. So you're using it to start with, but you're not using it ongoing. It's not like a farm that they just mm. blast it out every year or whatever. It's... Um, it's working towards less and less herbicide on a patch of land if you're using the herbicide. Um, and um, the cut and paint, you do end up using a lot of herbicide because it is quite concentrated, I feel. I mean, we do do ring barking, um, which probably takes Brilliant. more ring barking, I think, rather than because it does leave the structure there, which I quite like. And well, partly a lot of the woody weeds we do, it's not like there's huge amounts. Like we're looking for rabbit holes and other things at the time. And so we just have a hatchet on us. And then you come across a woody weed, you, you do a ring bark. And sometimes I do re-sprout from the base, some species. but And then you have to knock those off. So you have to come back. It could be a couple of years later, you come back and do another pass, something like that. So we're not looking at where I'm working, huge amounts of woody weeds are sort of, you know, they're quite sparse and we sort of look for them while we're looking for other things. We are going to uh, have to move to question time, but I thought, Paul, we might just hear from you about herbicides because I know a lot of people are asking about, yeah, how we prioritise it and, and how we, where we use it. Um, so we'll do that and then we'll jump into questions.
Okay, so um, yeah, like so we we do use herbicides, um, and we use it according to uh, the regulations and advice from the Australian Veterinary Medicines Association, because they've they have scientists and they've got uh, they've rigorous, rigorously rigorously tested and assessed a lot of the chemicals that are used in Australia, so we abide by those rules, um, and uh, yeah, and we. Look, as it's as it was discussed, you know, it is a tool. It's one of the tools that we use, and maybe on occasions it might be seen as being used too much. But uh, it depends on the situation. And I think when it comes to the drill and fill woody weed situation, where there's, I don't know if there's any other alternative. I mean, if you cut it down, it comes back worse. So yeah, Desert Ash to... loves doing it, doesn't it? I've, Pardon? Desert Ash is one of those ones I learned yeah. the hard way. I've done the, the complete cut and paint and then watched just like millions of them just pour yeah, up around so the next. We the don't next have year. much. Yeah. We don't have anything for that particular method. We have to use it there. It just has to be really well, um, uh, properly used, safely used, according to the label instructions. Um, and I think it's effective. It's quite effective for woody weeds. Um, in certain situations, I think it's also, it, it can work for a spot spray situation, um, as long as it's uh, properly used. If, it's, if, if the contractor or staff member or whoever's using it is using it according to guidelines, it is effective. Um, and the, in a lot of our bushland situations, that's, that's what we do. So a lot of it would be manual, it would be cut and paint, brush cutting, but then occasionally there would be the spot spray depending on the situation. Um, but I have to say, like, too, in some situations, we do, like, roadside spraying. So we are obliged under uh, state laws, the Catchment and Land Protection Act um, of 1994. We, um, everyone, that's not just us as a council, but everyone, every agency, everyone, private landowners are um, obliged to manage noxious weeds. And one of those is blackberry. And that is our number one weed that seems to spread quite rapidly and um you know and we we get notices we do get notices from uh, agriculture victoria on occasions and they'll give us a list of roadsides and say you're you know council you need to be managing these sites so um you know i mean i'm so in, in some of those situations yeah like just to try and prevent the, the spread of seed and to try and stop it from spreading further is is another reason why we do a bit of spot spraying um but uh, yeah, it needs to be put into context because uh, yeah, we need to use all solutions as well. Um, yeah, look, council do want to reduce chemical use over time. I mean, look, really, when you look at it, a chemical is a poison. It's used to it's used to target like a, a certain plant. I mean, in, in some cases, it's used for pest animals as well. Uh, so um, yeah, it is going to be something that's deemed nasty, I suppose. But uh, there had like as Colin was saying, there hasn't been enough research done to actually justify that it is either good or bad at this stage. Uh, there, there are some studies out there and I really recommend if people wanna read a bit more about glyphosate, for example, um, the Invasive Species Council have put out a report recently. Um, it was done by Tim Lowe, who's an author and ecologist. And um, yeah, this organization is a non-profit uh, government, non-government, non-profit government, non -profit government um, group um, or they're not a government group, they're an independent group, sorry, uh, you know, which, which have members of scientists, ecologists, academics, all sorts. And um, yeah, they're just lobbying for better laws uh, for invasive species and policies. But it's a really good uh, report. It's called Glyphosate, a Chemical to Understand. Um, right. it, it gives, he's done a lot of research into all the, the reportings on it, even um, the classification by the um, International Agency of um, cancer research yep i remember that yeah. one it's in the category with bacon and smoking or something yeah like. so <laughs> and drinking um greater than 60 degrees tea, um tea? yeah Drinks. drinking tea and coffees <laughs> yeah, yes yeah. Um, so i mean it, it's got to be put into context um i think if um look yeah i'm not going to say it's it's good but um yeah at this stage it's it's deemed safe to use um even work safe saying that it's still safe to use the municipal association of victoria so the mav who um, look over local governments as part of the state government uh, are saying that it's it's still safe to use um, unless until it's specifies otherwise and at this stage uh, there's no science at this stage okay so um in terms of tim lowe 
um, Australian Association Bush Regenerations oh, have yes. a, a Reveg TV and they've got a um, thing of him talking about oh, great. Um, yep. that. Yeah, that the group's report. good. Yeah, they do a lot of forums uh, with like-minded bushland managers. Yep. And they, they really try and work. organise training. And um, so Maybe a, we can put that on the yeah. email that goes out after this yep. session, um, some of these things that have been mentioned, as well as our um, Yarra Rangers plant director and things like that. And, and, you know. and in terms of, and I'm not sure how significant it is, in terms of glyphosate, it, does, it is broken. If you've got low nutrient sites and you want to keep them low nutrient, then the glyphosate does break down into nitrogen and phosphorus. So you are also adding nutrients to your site, which probably isn't ideal. Yeah, there's mm. a lot to, con lot to consider. Mm. In that. But I don't want to, I mean, glyphosate is probably one of the safest and well-known herbicides and getting a lot of rap where I think you have to, we have to be looking at some of the alternatives that if people are pushing not to use glyphosate are less known and some of them are definitely not as safe mm. for people. All right, well, we're going to cut to audience questions. Uh, so the first question from Liam, thank you, Liam. I uh, hope you're still watching. Um, would, how would you deal with asparagus fern that has overrun a block? Another one. I didn't even get back to the onion <laughs> weed and the holly that I was throwing out earlier, but let's go to asparagus fern now. Um, can someone just describe it for me? Um, oh, it's a creeper. It's got fine, fine foliage. Like it almost looks like a little hairy, I suppose. It's um, kind of like a yellowy green colour and it has little red berries over the winter period. So it's not edible, not like real asparagus. Oh, huh? no, Just to no, check, no, I do no, love an edible um, weed. But, so. but it's got these, um, these tubers. Very the extensive so underground. Yeah, so it's very, okay. it's not something that you can just pull out with hand okay. or you're going to break it and it's going to come back. And it's something that you'd have to like pretty much dig up if you're going to or manually goats. remove. Or goats, would goats eat it? Uh, <laughs> we've had small amounts of asparagus fern on some of our sites and they have eaten it uh, and they've eliminated it but in the longer term you know, goats aren't the quick fix mm. uh, but, but where you've got a site that's dominated by something and it sounds like you've got a lot of that Liam's got a bit of a problem there <laughs> uh, if you put goats on it there they might go oh no thanks not, not if it's all I've got. To make the milk yeah, disgusting. Right. I, mean, I, don't mind a, I don't mind a few Brussels sprouts on the side of my plate, but I'm not going to have yeah. any Brussels sprouts. Fortunately, it's a very difficult weed. And if it's all over the property and that's covering, yeah. you know, like it's, that's a tough one. Like you're not going to be digging up the whole backyard just to Start small. get rid of it, yeah. you know. Or use herbicide. Yeah. Yeah. Start or, or it's small. Be, I mean, yeah, you know, you just choose the spot you want first and but it will be a lot of work it, it, it's good for winter your fitness campaign and get you warm when you're feeling cold don't turn on the heater go out and get a bit warmer <laughs> and get back in yeah. and, you back, know. back breaking work yeah. <laughs> yeah. you yeah. might yeah. have Otherwise. to factor in the physio or whatever afterwards yeah, but yeah. if you weigh up the two you'll mm. definitely get a workout but if so they've got a somatic like digging yeah, up. Yeah, dig, well, if you can't, if you can't do I that. I wouldn't even get in with the matic, actually. If, it's... Uh, if, you, if you have to go the herbicide option, it's going to have to be something like met that was mentioned yeah, before, because I'd have to get into before. the... But again, the, there's the other problem with asparagus fern is that it's there's not a lot of foliage on there, yeah. um, and a lot of the a lot of the the I suppose it comes from that base from that that root ball that's yeah. underneath there. Um, there's not a lot of foliage on there, so there's not a lot of the chemical that can sort of get into it. So it's sort of yeah, yeah. it's. It's a really good question, and I feel sorry for you, Liam. No sorry, biological but, you know, controls. Yeah. We haven't got no, any. Chooks don't no, love it. No, what not what else? Of, no. Bandicoots. Do we have can someone release them? No. no. I wish. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, there's two options. I think was herbicides and um, yeah. manual removal. Physical removal, and there is yeah. stuff that you can get out there for physical removal that uh, I suppose doesn't involve you having to, to bend over and all that sort of stuff and, and hurt you know using your back. So, you know, have a look at some of those hardware places and look for some of those you know the sort of things you can sort of stab in the ground and twist around and stuff. Oh, that might might be a little bit easier. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Um, on to our next question. Oh. So this one, uh, two more, two more species. Oxalis and agapanthus. So, um, <laughs> agapanthus, just to specify, because someone has asked another question saying um, it's only the purpley blue flowering agapanthus that is, I think, the rampant cedar, is, um, yeah. and that we mustn't tar tarnish 
<laughs> anyway, um, not all agapanthus are the same, is what someone else mm. has said, um, mm. because I think they might be a noxious weed or perhaps, oh, I'm not sure. No, they're not listed as noxious. They're not listed? No, but they okay. are an environmental weed. Okay. They do and, um, travel. Kind of a mix of an, an ornamental and an environmental weed. So many people either love it or, or hate agapanthus. I'm in that category. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, in the, I'm, in the, I'm in the hate category. No, I'm absolutely. in the love. Yeah, yeah. I feel like they just always look green and lush, yeah. and I'm sure they're great fire protection. Oh, and I have good for erosion. Well, I don't I have any, but our neighbours have them, and I think they're quite oh, cheery look, and lovely. It's but tough. they do do the droop, and I'm every time I drive around and I see those puff balls hanging over all the seeds right in front of the the gutter going down to the creek. I go, yeah. Ooh. <laughs> Sometimes I've been known to walk by yeah. with my snips, but yeah, um, take the seed head <laughs> off. It's a, it's a, good it's a, it's a manual take, removal yeah. thing. I'm Okay. Yeah, I, I've had goats Canical. on a site uh, in Fentry Gully and they had a lot of agapanthus and the goats really didn't touch them. Okay. So mm. on mass, they won't touch them. The odd plant, they will. But uh, so, it, you know, anoxalis, again, you know, this is a terribly difficult plant to control because it just, it's this tiny little bulb that produces bulblets. Mm. So it produces seed and it's vegetatively spread as well. So... Is so it poisonous it, for goats? Because it's poisonous for people, uh, isn't it, oxalic? It, it has sure, oxalic yeah. acid in the foliage, but they do nibble at it. Yeah, they, mm. they actually do. So the way I deal with a plant like that on some of our bigger sites, and I know at Maribyrnong where we're doing some work, where we've got a lot of box thorn and a lot of oxalis, um, uh, I would be saying just interplant. Because it's not allelopathic, because it comes and goes. So for probably, what, at least six months, maybe seven months of the year, it's not there. It's only up. It's like a mm. daffodil, effectively. It's still there. Yeah, it's still there. <laughs> it's kind of system, isn't it? I know what you're saying. So, trying to outcompete it by just yeah, chopping so, it up with a lot okay. of plants. So, so you'll end up with bare ground. So I would, again, it depends on what you want. Mm. But if you want to have a, a bushy area, a more indigenous area, then I'd be planting native grasses into it. Mm. Uh, and I'd be, uh, I'd be hiring somebody with a few little goats to come in and <laughs> or somebody small. Or, or you could you <laughs> could lay people. You could lay carpet over it. Oh, you can certainly yeah. treat oh, you it. Can it. You mean like put um, like a sheet on it so can, the sun will that's right. cook it. Doesn't yeah. it depend on the situation what you do? Mm. I mean with every weed it depends on the situation. That's right. Yeah. I know I know for and us. Whether you even bother. Yeah, yeah. oxalis. Is I mean, in oxalis, there's native oxalis. Yeah. There's weedy. There's different species of weedy oxalis. I mean, yeah. oxalis is a bit. There's yeah, a lot okay. of weedy oxalis. There's yeah. a lot of weedy oxalis. So make sure it's not oxalis. a native oxalis that maybe we want to keep. Majority of native yeah. oxalis would be in remnant vegetation okay. yeah. Yeah. rather than people's yeah. gardens. Yeah, pretty small. Yeah. Okay. I mean, there's no context given. Yeah. Look, it's a so tough one. That smothering one though hasn't come up earlier. So because I have also seen people put out. Um, and I've, I've tried it with my old pizza boxes. Um, you put out the, <laughs> the cardboard and yeah. then mulch on top of that. Yeah. Um, that. Would that be sort of effective for some of those? Only things, for or? the short term. Like yeah, okay. mulch, mulch again, again, eventually it breaks down. Eventually the, the plants will start to go through that mulch. It will come up again. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But Depends again, if you, if, you, if you put something down that, that won't break down uh, or you do it repeatedly, you do it at the right time, you mm. can do it. Mm. But it takes a lot of work and not and people lose enthusiasm. They'll do it for the first six months or the first year and then they just, they're not winning, so they mm. give up, which is understandable. Um, but you're right, it, you know, it, it depends on the site, depends on the... Depends on what you want. It depends yeah. on what you want. Mm. You know, if you've got, a, if, you've got, if you've got a garden situation where you've got azaleas and, and other things growing there, well, then it's a nightmare. You, can't, you don't want to spray either, then yeah, that's exactly. the situation. Yeah. Yeah. But if you did, it would have to be something. It can't be glyphosate. It doesn't work on oxalis. It has to okay. be. Well, it, it'll hit it, it'll just, knock it back, but yeah, I don't yeah, think yeah, it, will, it comes yeah, back. Yeah, okay. I've I, I, I got rid of it. You spray it, it resprouts the same year. You spray it again. It resprouts the same year. You spray it again. Mm. It, you get it. Yeah, yeah and, 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 and actually people say pulling it out doesn't work, but I've pulled it up around mm -hmm. orchids and you just, I don't actually even try and get the bulbs. I just pull it and, and I come back and I pull it. You do that. You weaken the bulb. You yeah, start. and I've done it in a couple of areas. This is the third year and they um, this year, the light juice. Mm. Again, repetitive follow-up. It's keep repetitive it. follow-up. Yeah. I mean, because they're special plants, I put in that time. Mm. So it depends yep. what it's at. So I think you can use oxalis. 
I mean, I can use glyphosate <laughs> on it. Um, I mean... Have you had any experience with... But obviously the glyphosate kills all the grasses. <laughs> if you've got nosy grasses, mm. you'd want something more selective. Mm. But... Um, Have does. you had any experience with bioweed? What's organic bio herbicide. Mm. Mm. I, I've never tried it on Oxalis, but, um, yeah, it's kind of... A, um, this is the, the oil sort of miss. stuff. Like some, some weeds, it seems to burn it off, but it has... Because we've done trials with it at Council. It has burnt off certain weeds, only a selective group of weeds. Um, usually, the like I said before, more the annuals and the softer weeds rather than sort of the harder ones. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it comes back still just as rigorous. So you'd have to do repeat, 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 more so than with uh, synthetic herbicides. Reading the label, it sounds like it would be great for annual weeds amongst yeah. perennial grasses, like annual grass and like perennial. But I read the label and decided actually... I think it's it might be natural and therefore it's labeled organic or whatever. It's, yeah, it's what it's but it's like. not actually great. It's still scheduled. It's still a poison. It's yeah. a poison, so it's still... and I I think as a user, I would be rather using glyphosate than it. Yeah, yeah there's not enough evidence, uh, not enough information on. Mm. These I mean, you know, so, so you know, yeah, it, yeah, it, it eats into cells. That's so okay. I mean, you get it on your, you can get it in your skin, mm. your eyes, and stuff. It doesn't sound very nice. No. There's been issues with um, like spray packs as well. Like there's, there's heavier corrosion happening with certain products. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, it's it's affecting the. the, the I think it was, it was the the amount having to be used as well was the issue we had. It was um you know in in a spot where we might have used maybe a liter of, of glyphosate in a day, we had to if it was like something like 20, 20 liters of this product, it was a heavily acidic based mm -hmm. product as well. So it was like what are we doing to the pH levels in the soil? Mm -hmm. uh, and the other one was too. I just yeah I have to say it, but the, I've seen like a little. Uh, like a slater, like a bitchy boy, as I call it, but a little slater bug. You know, he sort of got in the in the firing line. Well, that's unfortunate. I watched this little hard shell animal, uh, yeah, curled up and was in like visible pain and, and died from from this uh, particular thing. So I was sort of bit like after that, I was like, one and done. We tried it. Uh, yeah, I don't no. think I'll use that product again. I'm not going to name yeah, the product. Probably still yeah. be yeah. used. But yeah. yeah, it has to be like the right particular weeds and yeah. Okay. Well, on to our another family favourite, Wandering Tradescantia. Uh, and Ian has an acre Thanks. in the Dandenong Ranges and is having issues. Uh, so hand removal is not practical due to the large area and being um, less physically able. Uh, is there any non-toxic spray that I can use to eradicate the trad? So we've covered off a yeah, little bit of... Yeah, I don't think of... there's non-toxic spray. I'm and afraid. what about, because I forgot to ask you that earlier, um, excitement about steam sugar salt mm. some of those um, other yes. things well, or flames yeah um, um, any of trad's tough i mean trad's a tough one um, a brush cutter <laughs> brush cutter and raking steam oh, yeah. steam, steam works but it uses it. a lot yeah. of i would just resource. keep brush cutter because it's not in my areas it doesn't grow in my areas yeah. I don't yeah. know how much you'd have to do it. Depends on we, their property. They might not be able to. Yeah, it might be steep. It might be steep. But then you maybe yeah. um, enjoy it. The tread. <laughs> I'll tell you my recommendation. I mean, but I actually think it's the same as everything. You start small. You start in a little area. You put whatever you want there. You gradually move. And it's surprising. You can think, oh, this is this huge area. But... You just go out there a little bit, little bit, little bit, little That's bit, little exactly bit, little bit. Little bit. If it's in your yeah. own place and you enjoy, you know, go out and enjoy the sun. Yeah. Mm. Go out and enjoy the wind. Go out and enjoy whatever. I mean. And, you, and you're yeah. right, and I, I agree. <clears throat> but not everyone's got the time. That's, that's the other mm. part, isn't it? I don't yeah. have the time or the inclination. Yeah. Or the physical ability. Well, yeah, this person is um, they, they can't And do so it anyway. goats do yeah. eat wandering trad, I think. Is that what you were yeah. saying yeah. earlier? They would have a, they would have a go? Yeah, they. Uh, we, we did a site uh, for Melbourne Water, which was uh, willows, just a huge stand of willows and only trad under that. And it was like walking through snow. It was almost knee-high mm. trad. And... Uh, and uh, the goats, um, the, the young willows, they ring barked and killed. The larger ones, we felled them. We didn't cut and paint. We just felled them and they killed the willows, killed the regrowth from the stump, and they completely took out the trad. Oh. So, so you had a desert. 
Yeah. So did you do something planned? No, no, yeah, no. no. So, no so, <laughs> Tell so, us the happy story. So, so what we had was, what we had, and, and, I, and I printed some photos of this in a book that I did on that site, and, and the regrowth of Juncus and Carex and Persicaria was fantastic because the sun came in and, uh, and it, was, it was clearly previously a Melaleuca ericifolia or paper bark sort of billabong. And, uh, and it, was, it was a fantastic result. We had lots so, of So, I mean, with the goats, what you're doing is gradually changing the landscape. That's right. It? And that's what I, my aim is when on sites I work at, to gradually change. And don't, don't start with this grand, like, let's... Yeah. Yeah, we want it now. Yeah. We yeah. want it now. But you also want to have a vision of where, you, where you're going yep, yep. as you move into your gradual plan because I think... At my place, I, I don't think we had the vision at the end. So we got tired of rolling the trad or um, removing it and, and doing anything really but because we, had, we, we didn't have the vision at that point of what was going in there. We weren't ready to put something else there. So um, it's a bit of, bit of both having the vision, I think, of where you, what you want to create, whether that is habitat or whether that is a nice garden or whether that is... Um, That's where you're you know, si sitting and watching it for 12 months. Yes. It fits in, you know, you're sitting and watching this dream about what it could be yeah. and you discuss <laughs> it and, you know, yeah. and, and it, yeah, it's a good use of time. Mm. <laughs> I think that's the other one I find interesting too is like you might have that that intention at first of like you know you want the area to look a certain way sort of thing but then as you start to you know get rid of things like trad and stuff like that and and like you're saying that the like persicaria might come back up or something like that. once you start to see I suppose that native vegetation that is, actually is responding and coming back it can kind of change that initial plan mm. like a, a, and quite a lot sometimes too and I think that's yeah. um that's another really good thing is like you know sort of be adaptable and, and not mm. I suppose not um so rigid in, in the thought process, um, you know, try not to think of, well, I want that garden that I've seen over there and I want my house to look exactly like that. Um, yeah, I suppose try and be a bit more responsive to what is there and, and um, you know, I wouldn't say accept it, but, uh, you know, sort of sometimes learn to like what naturally wants to grow there in, in, that, in that native space as well. Yeah. It has to be said, though, that if you take out the dominant weed, whether it's asparagus, fern or oxalis or trad, mm. you're likely to get another weed or the same weed mm. trying to come back. True. And yeah. so... So I think we, we've all had experience with that. So, mm. so it does take time um, and uh, uh, you, you're never going to completely replace a dominant weed with uh, uh, a, a, a more preferred plant unless you plant it, mm. <laughs> really, unless you say, okay, I want this area to be um, uh, a native grassland. Okay, so I'm going to deal with the trad or whatever it is uh, in whatever way is the most economical and effective, uh, and then I'm going to have a, have a, a real a view to plant something in there to replace it. Um, I think you have to have that. How do you know, because um, this was another question that someone earlier had asked, how do we, so if nurseries are still um, selling things that might become a, an escape, you know, what we call a weed later, um, how do we as um, gardeners know what to put in and you know obviously weeds are just plants that are growing really well and yeah. <laughs> have made great use of that space and they're yeah. you know taking it they're great um, but we don't want to you know plant something that's going to become tomorrow's bush, you know bushland mm. weed or, or whatever and and how how do we tell yeah I would just assume that nurseries aren't going to sell things that could be on that list, but mm. that's not the case because they're different <laughs> everywhere, aren't they? So, yes, you right. know, over that side of the hill might become a weed and over this side of the hill might not become a weed. And, um, yeah, how, how will we know as, as gardeners what, what to put in instead? We can look at your EVCs first, your ecological vegetation class in your bioregion that you're a part of. I think that's a really good place to start. How do we start. look at that? <laughs> uh, that's generally something you can find online. There's, um, I suppose, some good links through places like uh, is it Nature Kit and also uh, I think there's another place on Delp as well that you can have a look for these things. Okay. Um, but, yeah, I think finding, understanding, I suppose, what region you're in and what class of vegetation you're in also gives you, I suppose, a good run of what plants would actually sort of benefit, uh, like, you know, benefit the area you're in. Um, 
And I suppose from that, then you can start looking at things like the uh, range of plant list. And then you know, if you're not sure what the name is, and then you can start to match up, you know, you, I suppose what what colours you enjoy from that mm. sort of stuff. What I did see the directory. At, you, know? you could sort by colours and yeah, heights yeah. and all that sort of stuff. Exactly. So, so like, I think that's the other thing, you know, like native plants don't have to be boring. There actually is like so many like interesting colours and stuff that go with them. Like it's... You know, people often ask me, you know, why do you do uh, the sort of conservation work in Australia? It's like, well, we're one of the most unique um, landscapes around the world and we're the, the only place that some of this vegetation exists. Like that's worth something hanging on to. Um, you know, as much as there is other plants from other parts of the world that do look absolutely beautiful and that there's, I'm not going to doubt that, um, the, the native vegetation we have here is so distinct to like this place. Mm. And I think it's something really worth looking out for. So I would say don't, don't be scared to get it into your garden at home. Um, there's so much benefits that can happen with it. So yeah, EBCs, I think is a good, good, good spot okay. to start, but you know, yeah, research other, really, yeah, isn't it? or yeah. even just contact your local council <laughs> and, um, someone can <laughs> answer some questions for you, you know, like, or just, yeah, you just look up weed lists and say, oh, yeah, and I've heard many people go, I just I just didn't know that was a weed. Mm. Got it in my garden. Oops, I bought it. You know, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I guess there are, um, uh, just reminded, there are the community-run nurseries or the private, you know, Indigenous plant nurseries and some people that, you know, drove past the yelling bow one on the way here mm. and um, there's the yeah. Southern Dandenongs um, one up at Birdsland in uh, Belgrave South. So, yeah, those sorts of people obviously are, are only going to sell things that would be really, um, I guess I think um, the word is endemic to here. Is that yeah, local? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. they're local. I um, mean, in terms of just buying something native, like things like couriers, and the horse has bolted a bit on this, but <laughs> just that they just cross with the native, the, the, the local ones. And so you've got all these couriers that are this mismatch through the bush. And, and so, there's some things it's better to go with a local one um, rather than a na just a native mm. one. Like that closeness can yeah. be a problem, I think. Yeah, I, I I'd like to see some term it, just on that. I'd love to see some terminology change when it comes to plants. Is this this is going like, to be the uh, last point because we're right on time. Oh, so no. <laughs> um, make it really good, Darren. Oh, God. <laughs> I suppose the distinction between native plants and, and indigenous plants. I like to always say native, yes, it can be native to Australia. The indigenous plants means that it's local to that area. And I think that's something that um, I suppose, yeah, just on that, it, it would help with those scenarios is if uh, nurseries were to more, I suppose, uh, list those things that are local to that area I think would make it mm. a bit easier yeah thank you Darren and thank you to everyone who sent in questions and I'm so sorry we didn't get to all of them